My research now is uh, on uh, motherhood and family meals. Um, I suspect that my interest in this topic uh, is rooted in um, my own childhood experience uh, with family meals. Family meals, my mother took great stock in family meals and we had a, a sit down uh, meal every uh, two out of three nights uh, of the week and the reason it was like that was because my father was a firefighter and he was gone every third night. So every third night we had what we called um, whatever um, which meant I'm so not cooking for you people so uh, figure it out and the you know leftovers or cereal or something like that but but uh, at, around our family dinner table this was uh, it was very mm, complicated mm, my father wanted pe children to not say anything or really frankly not do anything um, <laughs> try not to move a lot I mean it was it was uh, very strict and complicated and so that had an impact on me and then I attempted to fix some of that in my own uh, family with my children and um, and that was complicated too um, most of my children my children were mostly raised by me and their uh, stepdad and so uh, there were some clashing personalities there that made um, dinner time not mom I would get out this conversation starter book so we could try and like have a convo but um, so I had a, a, a teenager and I had a, a very young uh, boy who wanted to tell stories except he was terrible at it. But that didn't stop the excruciating detail of the stories that wouldn't end. Um, I always thought that, I, I, I think I even wrote about this in my blog one year, one time about the, I, I would like to strike the word and from the language of young people. Uh, young children, they shouldn't be allowed to say and because it means more. They're going to say more, and then they say and, and then there's an and, and then there's more. I'm like, if we could just get rid of the and, maybe there we could get rid of the more. But anyway, so trying to make sense of those and trying to make sense of wanting to spend time with my family, realizing that in busy lives, this is the time that we have to be together, and um, having a difficult time uh, managing that. So I started looking at. Um, started noticing this, this uh, emphasis on the family meal. And uh, coming from uh, institutional work, policy work, uh, public health uh, work, uh, urging families to have family meals together more often because of uh, links to um, mostly adolescent health and well-being. So lots and lots, a decade and a half, over a decade and a half of research, Columbia University and University of Minnesota in particular, but then lots of other folks from that, talking about uh, how family, shared family meals have a uh, high benefit for, uh, for children and, as I said, adolescents in particular. So some of the, of course now my papers are out of order, uh, I'm a great example for my communication students. Um, where the heck? Okay, there it is. Don't ever say where the heck when you're speaking. Just uh, ten things to not, oh there, to not do. Okay, so some of the, uh, the what they talked about was a uh, higher number of meals per week shared by families results in things, decreases the likelihood of things like substance abuse, sexual activity risk, overweight and disordered eating, poor academic performance, low self-esteem, getting in fights, and other disorderly behavior, depression, suicidal and suicidal ideation and as well as increases in healthy food intake, vocabulary growth, and the likelihood of being able to handle, handle cyberbullying. So the, and the research actually list goes on. So I became very concerned that there was this, what I thought was a very oversimplified solution to depression, early sexual activity, uh, um, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, um, depression, suicidal ideation, because the, the uh, academic literature and then the media literature that, that came from that made it seem like if we could just, what I like to say is add family meals and stir, we would have this recipe for children's, you know, certain uh, success. And so if we don't have children's certain success, then we can look at family meals and ask the parents, and I use the term parents loosely, 
uh, why they won't just give their children more family meals if we know it's going to do uh, all these um, amazing things. So I think that the impact is overstated, the complexity of it understated. Uh, there's been very little research on why families who don't have meals together often don't have meals together often. Most of the research is focused on educating parents Again, in quotes, about, which I'll explain in a second, about the importance of having family meals together. I say in quotes because we continue to have research, and I've got you know, stacks of it, plenty that I can cite if you're interested, um, that says that m women are still largely responsible for family meal provision. Mothers are uh, carrying uh, a, a great majority of that, of that load. So what we find is that uh, women are hearing those messages about what parents should do differently than how uh, how father uh, mothers are hearing it differently than how than how fathers uh, might. We also find that um, in um, uh, research about uh, family well-being and public health that women hear messages are influenced by messages about health and well-being in ways that are very different than how or whether men are influenced by uh, you know uh, shifting food practices so that they are. Um, more beneficial for children. So health. So if we talk to uh, fathers about ch children have rights to eat in a particular way, they seem to be responsive to that. Mothers are more responsive to uh, children need it for, to eat in particular ways for health reasons. So I became very interested in that research and how that was oversimplified and, um, and, and more importantly was uh, devoid of any contact with mothers. So they were nobody's asking the mothers. So they're asking adolescents mostly what they think and what they remember. And uh, sometimes they would talk to the mothers and the fathers about the number of times they eat a week, but not really about what makes it complicated, what what parts of it interest you. So what concerned me was that all of the uh, intervention literature was about, was aimed toward parents, which mothers were mostly hearing, and um, not at social institutions at all. No one looking at how, how is it that sharing family meals is very complicated for families. And how might, me, might we as a society, how might we institute uh, government funding, government policy, public health messages that take a look at something other than parents? So as soon as we see something wrong in the family, then we like to say, why don't the parents just you know, sort of do something else? So I became interested in that and wanted to make sure that there was maternal voice in the research on, uh, on family meals. I talked to 31 women uh, across six focus groups, and um, we just sat in focus groups and talked about uh, talked about their experience with family meals. That that research was funded by the ETSU's uh, Research Development Committee, and with that money, I was able to um, feed the mothers their dinner, and feed their children dinner, and pay for their children's childcare while the mothers were talking with me. I mean, one of the things I wrote in the report is you can't. You can't talk to mothers unless you've addressed the issue of the, the, the child care. So uh, I was able to, with the grant funding, I was able to, um, I was able to do that. And that was, that was really very exciting to take care of that. Ideally, they would go home having eaten and then we were able to talk about family meals and then go home and not have to deal with family meals. That was, that was, <laughs> that was the idea uh, behind that. And, that. and that really worked well. I was happy. And some of the mothers felt much better about relaxing to talk with me because their children were right in the same building uh, down a floor or two. So that, that research worked uh, well. And so then I, so it was just a focus group research and lots of data. And, uh, and, and I talked with them. And I'm going to share a couple of small quotes. But um, <clears throat> one of the things is that we find that food functions as a metonym for the family where the strength or weaknesses of feeding practices uh, represents in the popular imaginary the strengths or weakness of the institution of the family, which tends to represent this in the popular imaginary, the strength or weakness of the, um, of the nation. In fact, a country might even use family meals as a measure of national well-being like Britain is doing. <clears throat> And national well-being, happiness, and harmony like Britain is doing. So it's not surprising then that sh any shifts in family meals are characterized in the literature, whether po uh, popular literature or academic literature, in terms of lament and loss 
and how much it used to be so wonderful when we all sat around the table with all of these bowls of steaming food together which is, of course, not the experience of lots and lots and lots and lots of people uh, ever, and um, in, including now. Um, and so we, um, so we have this image of, of how that should look, and we, it doesn't look that way, so we make assumptions in the literature about how it used to be that way, and if we could just get back to that way, right? And so what we find is that the, the, um, the emphasis on um, sort of the historical frequency of family meal sharing is over-exaggerated. If you take a look at uh, authors like feminist uh, historians like Stephanie Kuntz. And that the current commitment to shared family meals is underrepresented. I had anticipated when I talked with mothers that they were going to tell me tales of being spread so thin and run ragged because they felt very compelled to have this very elaborate meal and they um, very compelled to have this very elaborate, I just got the five minute uh, warning, so now I'm throwing up. oh my gosh, five minutes, to have this elaborate meal that they were spread very thin, feeling very guilty or very strung out. And interesting, what I found is, is was not that among these 31 women anyway. A majority of them were saying, um, I, in fact, I wrote a, a book chapter called uh, uh, I'm Not Sorry or feeding without apology. And they, um, they would just do what they could do and they didn't apologize for it. So I was, I was really um, pleased with the very empowered voices with which they spoke. Like, yeah, not gonna happen at my house. So we're gonna have cereal. So we have the fruit and I try to throw in a vegetable and I don't have time for that. So I mean, I'm doing what I can do. And so on Thursdays, we always have the vegetables. But Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we got soccer and we have music and we have karate. And uh, if we're lucky, we'll get drive through. And, and that's just the way that's going to go. So I was, I was really very happy to see that. Um, one of the problems is it, all of this is happening in a neoliberal context where um, services that once were freely available to families are now um, uh, not freely available to them and that families are responsible for providing them for their families. And so uh, parents are responsible for providing them for their families. So there's this this um, institutionalization of, a, of, of what I call, f of what's called fam familialization, where the re all the responsibility lies on the family, not in the schools, not in public health domains, n not uh, in government policy, but with the family. If things are wrong with the family, then the family needs to fix it. Um, and so that, that's one of the problems with it, is that we're not looking at what's happening institutionally and structurally so that we can address those problems about why it, really, it is really, really very difficult for families to manage sit-down shared family meals in, in, given the way that uh, the society is you know, frenetically run uh, in, in these times. So if we should do something edgy like talk with meal providers about meal provision who could help us move beyond Pollyannic reads uh, that sentimentalize and sacralize the family meal, we could learn a little bit of something about how family meals function, but also how they function relative to the systems and the discourses that direct them in which they are embedded, we might know something. We know that appetites are any, uh, a kind of emotionally flavored hunger, that women's dinner practices are not just care work for others, but also a kind of identity work for themselves. Um, that sensory dimensions of homemade food can contain idealized memories of childhood and experiences associated with those memories. So it's a very loaded, thick concept that we, that we should be talking about that we're not. Okay, I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts. I'm over time. Just stand by. Okay, so this piece, uh, what I talked about here was uh, how, in this particular uh, piece, was that how um, mothers explored uh, themes of continuity and change in their family meal work. So Becky, for example, was about allowing change to ensure continuity, interestingly enough. So she was unsure whether her approach emerged from her Asian upbringing or her experience living in the U.S. Mountain South. She was open to using whatever strategy she had to employ that would prevent her families having to sacrifice their value system, which for her meant sharing uh, family time. So if that meant dinner on the fly, if that meant fast food, if that meant in front of the TV, then whatever, we're having the family meal and, and that's just the way that's gonna go. She was willing to accept that the best one could hope for might be controlled chaos and that one might need to employ the services of what some other mothers refer to as an iNanny, iPads or smartphones uh, given to very young children to occupy their attention and keep them at the table so, so that the rest of the family could finish eating. Um, 
and, and so that they could be supervised, and so parents and older children can finish their meal. Uh, Becky's acceptance of fairly chaotic dinners and use of technology as a family meal facilitator opposed not only more widely invoked family meal narratives that we're all going to sit and it's all going to be so meaningful at the table, uh, and that there isn't going to be any technology because technology is bad. Um, so she pushed up against those uh, dominant uh, discourses by doing this differently at the same time that she was trying to continue and um, be responsive to a dominant discourse that we should have a shared family meal. Eva was a latchkey, identified as a latch, latchkey kid who prompted change to more routinized family meal plan. Her goal was to change from lone eating. She grew up in a family where she ended up eating by herself mostly and she didn't want that in her family so she said well, we're going to have families and she would say the phrase I don't do partials. She would just, so I'm, I don't do partials and I'm waiting till everybody's home and we are having the stinking dinner at night and if that's at nine o'clock and the kids are sleepy in their third grade class, whatever, we're going to have the family meal together. This is really important to me and we're big football fans so we're going to eat in front of the TV the entire football season. So, and this, so this, she was very um, responsive to the discourse that says you have to have it, but also pushing up against the discourse by making sure she could do it in the, in the way that she, could, uh, that she could live with. And then um, Hazel was interested in, um, was trying to focus on the continuity of her own experiences from her childhood, but also trying to be responsive to, the cha to changing her partner's experiences from his childhood. In my, my last couple notes. Um, also identifies as latchkey. So she had a, grew up with an informal approach. She wanted to continue an informal approach now. Um, but she wanted to encourage her husband to interrupt his pattern of micromanaging what the child eats, which he learned in his own childhood. Um, so she says, I was a latchkey kid. I came home in the afternoon and just sort of did my own thing. And I'm, I'm just used to informality. And then my husband always had a more formal meal structure growing up. And maybe that's why his emphasis is on the family meal and why he thinks it's important. He really monitors what our daughter eats, and most of it is she wants a cookie or she wants a dessert, but he's saying, no, you, you need to eat two more bites of your hot dog, and then you have a, can have a French fry. It's this closely monitoring uh, and watching, and that's really, that's not my approach. Um, and I pointed out to him before, you know, you're sort of repeating the same pattern that your mother did with you, and you have to clean everything off your plate, and that's why, you know, you have this relationship with food that you do now. So she said that's his way of trying to get her to eat a balanced meal and not eat just junk food. And part of my way of doing that would be to not bring so much junk food into the house. Contemporary media and other popular discourse are characterized by hyperbolic claims like, this is what you'll see if you Google family meals. Uh, family meal magical qualities, surprising power, big payoff, save your life. Simultaneously, these, ac ac these academic discourses marvel together at how easily invoked are this power and magic given the simple family activity of mealtime, which is how I always experienced it, very simple, an uncomplicated affair that requires small investment and little effort, and all of the mothers I spoke to, of course, uh, did not uh, uh, confirm that. Okay, so in closing, if we accept that family meals offer up, like Nestle Stouffer's Foods explains on its website, an environment that is, quote, naturally chock full of parental engagement, caring conversation, and a healthy dose of lighthearted banter, all of which are orchestrated without a whole lot of pressure or anxiety. We might be led to conclude along with Time Magazine in 2006 that the only variable that could foil such a marvel are the enemy's parental laziness and leniency. So uh, I've written a number of pieces and, and uh, what I'm trying to do, as I mentioned, is have this not be the only voice that we're hearing about how lovely and wonderful and, and curing the entire universe family meals are. Uh, and to hear from mothers about how that's more complex in, a, in the hopes that we'll be able to switch institutional discourses so that they incorporate what meal providers have to say about family meals, why it's complicated, and if we're going to expect that they produce many more per week, that we institute some strategies for helping them accomplish that. Thank you. Today, as Kelly Dorgan mentioned, I'm going to talk about a case study that came out of our research when we did um, story circles with women surviving cancer in Appalachia. Um, so to start off with, um, of course, there's me, there's Dr. Dorgan, and then our other co-author is Sadie Hudson. She, is, um, she works now at um, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She's a nurse um, and a professor there as well. So she was part of this research. Um, so, this is a very much larger study that we have been very successful in pulling chunks out and getting and published out there. 
So the broader purpose of this work was to identify the unique needs of uh, female Appalachian cancer survivors and to help better address the needs that they're experiencing in this, um, in this region um, and to provide possible strategies. A lot of very interesting work came out of here, um, but I always want to just cover like why Appalachia and why cancer, and I always love to include um, the Appalachian map, because before I started this research, I was pretty certain that Appalachia ended right here. There was no northern Appalachia. Um, so since that was my ignorance, I bring that um, to educate others as well. But it extends all the way up here, and it goes down here too. And you can see this little weird part here in middle Tennessee, and that is really about funding, because you do get more money um, if you're labeled a disadvantaged community. So one of the struggles Appalachia has, and unfortunately there are many, but health disparity is a big problem in this region. Um, there's higher incident uh, mortality rates of cancer, particularly lung, cervical, and colorectal. These have been attributed to lots of factors, um, geographic isolation, um, not enough healthcare providers in the region, cultural influences, um, you know, just lack of, or being un or underinsured as well. So the methodology for this study, as I said, it was, we did story circles, well we did a modified story circle. So ideally a story circle, you just bring people together and let them talk about whatever you want or they want to, but that can become a little challenging when you have uh, research goals to accomplish. So we had a semi-structured where we had cancer topics they could, or topics on cancer they could cover. Um, we collected data from September 2008 through April 2009. We did two story circles and then I went out and did three additional um, in-depth interviews with women that were unable to attend the story circles because we realized um, st stories were being lost. Women were unable to attend doing, due to being in treatment, um, financial issues, they couldn't take off work, or maybe they just didn't have transportation issues and truly couldn't get down to our sites. We had 29 female cancer survivors that participated in our work. Um, I already mentioned how we collected the data. Okay, so this is NAV what I'm looking particularly at is navigating the cancer communication between a mother-daughter um, that participated in our story circle. They were a very fascinating um, pair because they both had experienced um, same cancers uh, around the same age and how they navigated the stickiness of that was really fascinating and they were both in the same story circle together so their stories played into um, one another's. When going through the research, I found that there is very little out there on um, on cancer survivors, uh, well, as I say, parents and adult cancer survivors, um, communication interactions, which you'll ma mainly see as marital interactions during a cancer diagnosis, or young child um, and, a, a, and parent. Um, and you also see a lot of breast cancer that's very, um, popular topic right now. There's just lots and lots of work on breast cancer, which is great, but a lot of cancers are going, um, are being left out, unfortunately, and so it's really hard to, f um, to find anyone like this uh, pair that was in our story circle. So what you find with mother to daughters talking and, talking and navigating through cancer communication, um, it will impact and change their their communication styles. Research shows that if they had a good relationship before, they'll probably have a good relationship through. Um, and then you also find in the research that women talk about their mothers being um, just practical and economic support for them through their cancer journey. So mothers can move in, mothers can help out with um, caregiving of the children if they're in the home, the food preparation, um, help with a family meal, um, which is also important. And it's just a significant part of the experience. Um, and so then I kind of coined this phrase, connected cancer journeys. Uh, this was my epiphany yesterday, because these couples, as I said, they were both, both had the same type of cancers at different stages in their life. And so their stories were very much intertwined. Um, another t term that we have coined is cohabitating morbidities, which is um, the concept that individuals are living with other individuals with illnesses as well. So you have multiple illnesses within a family, within a household, and that's impacting how people are surviving um, what other uh, chronic illness they have. Um, they're linking their cancer journeys with other people's illnesses, um, and you can see this connected cancer journey in this mother-daughter relationship. 
So here's the case study participant. You have the mother. She's in her 70s, and she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at 24 while she was pregnant with the daughter, um, who is the other case study participant. Um, and then she had breast cancer at 43. And the daughter, who was in her 50s at the time, um, she had thyroid cancer at 13, 28, and 29. Um, and then she had breast cancer at 43, um, which was just very fascinating that same cancers and with breast cancer, same age of diagnosis. Um, and what you see is this concept throughout their stories is the passing of the cancer gene. And this is really the concept of um, guilt that they're both experiencing and navigating through. Um, so as the daughter says, I definitely inherited it, the cancer, because we had the exact same types of cancer and the breast was even on the same side, the same age, the exact same age. I don't think that's a coincidence, you know, it's obvious I inherited that. Um, and obviously she was able to talk about this in front of her mother, even though there was a lot of guilt. Like I said, her mother sat right next to her in the story circle. So I, I felt this was something they had talked about a lot. Um, three challenges I found with them. Um, the mother's guilt, the daughter navigating the mother's guilt, and then protective buffering um, from both the mother and the daughter through their cancer journeys. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So the mother definitely believed that she had caused harm to her daughter. Um, and that is not unusual when you start looking through the literature, as parents often feel, especially mothers, that they somehow contributed to their child's cancer diagnosis. So either it was from childhood stresses that they were unable to stop from happening, maybe a bad divorce, um, maybe losing a home, something like that. Environmental exposure, I know in this area there's a lot of concern about that. People always talk about um, the Eastman and what that brings to our area. And then the idea of passing the cancer gene as well. Um, so you have with the mother's guilt, she talks about, I gave my oldest daughter all the bad stuff because the mother was pregnant with this daughter during, um, during her cancer diagnosis. There is another daughter that doesn't have any type of cancer diagnoses. Um, and so they've definitely related that the older daughter's cancers come from the mother because the mother had cancer at the time she was pregnant. Um, she also said, you just feel so guilty. I think, what have I done? What have I done to this child? Which I think was so powerful. Um, and again, just remember the daughter is sitting right next to her through this whole thing. So they're both talking about their cancer stories. And I think that's really powerful that they're able to be very honest about this. Um, the other thing the mother said is the hardest thing I went through was nothing I suffered. It was what she suffered. And we heard a lot of other women talk in the story circles about wanting to take away someone else's um, illness or illness diagnosis. There was another woman who her mother had diagnosed with cancer after she had already survived breast cancer. And she goes, my mother's not strong enough for, her, for this. I really just wanted to take this away from her because I can survive it. I didn't think she could survive it. She's just little and frail. Um, and you see like this mother as well, she wanted to take that away. Um, next we have, so, they both recognized this guilt um, and it definitely impacted how they talked about it. And you'll see this later in the protective buffering is how they tried to navigate the guilt the mother was experiencing. Um, one of the things is the, when the daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer, she had to figure out how to tell her mom because she already knew with her prior three cancer diagnoses, her mom felt a lot of guilt about that. Um, and so she says, I told my mom like two or three days later about the breast cancer. I always knew how she felt she was to blame for all the stuff I had. So she talked in detail about her strategy to talk to her mom um, or disclose to her mother about her cancer diagnosis. Um, another thing that was thrown into the mix, it was right by Christmas. Um, so the holidays are a stressful time anyway. And so she's like, well, well, here we are like decorating the Christmas tree. And I'm like, oh, pass the angel and I have cancer. And um, we can put the angel right here and it'll be fine. And so that's where the title of this came from, how to find a way to talk to her real nonchalantly about it. Cause that's what she was trying to do. Cause she didn't want to increase the guilt her mother felt. Um, So that's what I just said. And also out of navigating guilt comes the concept of protective buffering, which is how they are protecting each other from the potential guilt they think the other is going to experience from this. So the daughter would protect her mother. I just had to figure out a way to tell her real nonchalantly that I had cancer, that it's gonna be okay, and I was gonna be okay. Um, and then you also have the mother 
and her protective buffering started with her first with the daughter's first cancer diagnosis, which is at 13 when she had thyroid cancer. So the mother says she was sitting, she her daughter was sitting in the floor with thyroid cancer. She came in from school and was sitting there. She turned her head and I said, "What's that on your neck?" And then the daughter continues on this story with, my parents chose not to tell me I had thyroid cancer when I was 13, so I just had surgery, no chemo, but they told me when I left for college when I was 18. Um, so I thought, wow, how to, all of a sudden five years later, you're like, surprise, I, you had cancer. Um, and then she was again you know, diagnosed in her late 20s with thyroid cancer as well. So protective buffering, it does help in navigating the messiness of relationships because sometimes it's just too challenging and emotionally exhausting to manage somebody else's feelings while you're also coping with your own feelings of, um, I have cancer, what's going to happen? Am I going to die? What are my treatments going to be like? And also more communication is not always better. I know when folks start talking about communication and communication scholars, like just keep talking about it. The more you talk, the better it'll get. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes less is more. And that's definitely what these women were thinking about when they were talking to one another regarding their cancer diagnosis. And they were ultimately trying to protect one another. So um, in closing, what you see through this um, case study is just the complexity of surviving cancer of Appalachia. It is not uncommon to have multiple people in the home that are surviving cancer or another illness, and that really impacts the stories um, that people have about their illness journey. And it also, um, about the mother-daughter cancer communication. I thought this was really fascinating, and I think this is a great area for more research about, to focus more on how women, um, mothers and daughters, are navigating through the messiness of their cancer journeys, because I don't feel that they're an uncommon case in this area. I'm sure there's lots more individuals out there that are, are dealing with these challenges. But cancer communication is messy. It doesn't matter if it's your mom or it's your friend. It's always going to be challenging. Um, and the mothers do play a critical role in this. And in previous research on daughters whose mothers were supportive during their cancer journeys, um, the daughters talked about how they couldn't have gotten through it without their mother but they were concerned that their mother didn't have enough support. And in that same study, they talked to the mothers and they were saying, I don't have the support to help care for my, my daughter during this journey. So I think more education in that way could help as well, would be a very huge benefit for this region with our um, cancer disparity. And also I'd like to mention that uh, this research was funded by some RDC grants and the Tennessee Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Thank you. First off, thank you to Phyllis for bringing us together. And gosh, thank you. We thought because of the rain, I don't know about you, but I thought everybody would have sense and stay away from us. Um, and it'd be just a couple of us. I will try to um, respect, uh, respect the time here so we can get some of your uh, thought-provoking questions. Uh, First off, I wanted to, what did I do with my book? Oh, yes, here, to add to heaviness. Um, this came out in, this is a seminal publication. This came out in 1999. And I think that this is what really started waking me up. And then, and then I went through a number of different uh, projects um, where we were talking about who are we going to partner with in the community for skin cancer prevention for breast cancer prevention, for cervical cancer prevention, who we're going to partner with. And of course, it was moms, 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 moms. So in 1999, this wonderful book, uh, quote, Help Your Man Get Healthy, An Essential Guide for Every Caring Woman. Thank you. Um, I just want to read some of the content for you, uh, and not some of the content. I want to read the uh, table of contents. So chapter one is mobilize your man's motivation. Chapter two is share the word on screening. Chapter three is boost your nutrition knowledge so you can feed your man and everybody else. Uh, chapter four, create a healthy kitchen, Dr. Kinzer. Uh, chapter five, get your man moving. Uh, chapter six, protect reproductive and sexual health. Uh, and you might want to read that, Dr. Baker, given your area of research right now. Uh, chapter seven, help your man kick butts, because you got to get him off cigarettes too. 
Chapter 8 de-emphasize alcohol, though at this point I want to actually emphasize alcohol because I am exhausted reading all that we uh, have to do as women. So as I said um, a while back, listening to, wor having the privilege of working with Catherine Duvall and listening to Dr. Amber Kinzer and these expectations after expectations of what we are supposed to do as women. Um, and then working with a number of community leaders who say, let's have women at the table, let's bring women to the table, uh, it made me actually motivated to go back into two existing data sets. And I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to fly, I'm going to fly through some of the methods, uh, even though I know that's the most interesting part for most of you. Um, but uh, yes, by the way, I did my own photography. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is the comprehensive uh, research team there, a wonderful group of, of uh, people from across disciplines and expertise. Emphasis today that, that this is preliminary preliminary secondary analysis. So it's, it's a brand new project about uh, going back into existing data on two different projects. The first project being, being the uh, defining uh, survivorship from the perspective of female uh, Appalachian cancer survivors. And you just heard a bit from uh, Catherine Duvall on that. This is a second project that we did also in, in the OS between about se, uh, 2007 uh, and culminating really in one of our, our, of our uh, um, articles in Women in Health on 2011 on perceptions of HPV and the HPV cancer uh, vaccine. These are some of our articles. Let us know if you would like to get a hold of those. I'd be glad to help you out. Uh, methods again that we're talking to, first uh, study that we're going to be looking at is uh, talking uh, to women about survivorship. You see again, um, talking to, we talked to 29 women, both in story circles and interviews. Uh, and then this is the, uh, this is the distribution of our participants. And I, and I want you to really critique us here. Look at this. Of course, you'll notice that we have a large number of breast cancer survivors. Um, and we can, we can certainly talk about this. And of course, we had to, we had to uh, convenience sample in order to make sure that other uh, types of cancers were, uh, were represented. And even then, the cervical cancer, uh, Catherine would tell you, is that we are actually suspect that this was not an actual can a cervical cancer survivor. She actually, what we suspect, had cervical cancer dysplasia, but did not know the difference between dysplasia and, and cancer. Uh, but had identified for years as a cervical cancer survivor. Second study is the HPV vaccine study. Again, going out into the communities of North, uh, Northeast uh, Tennessee and Southwest Virginia into focus groups and individual interviews. This was a total of 39 women that we conducted interviews uh, and focus groups with. And so what I did was, and I want to give a lot of credit to Catherine Duvall because she really hit me over the head with the uh, role of mothering in this research. And this is why. When we first went into this research, we weren't looking to examine mothers as, as informational agents. We, we just weren't. We wanted to know how cancer survivors define cancer. We want to know about how people are talking about and perceiving the uh, HPV vaccine. And Catherine, during her thesis, actually was the one that kept talking about mothers, mothers, mothers. And I kept pushing back against her, and she kept showing me, uh, Dr. Dorgan, without calling you stupid, the data are saying. It, that uh, it, that the women across groups are talking about mothers. So what I did across the data, I went in and did a manifest analysis looking at who are people mentioning. And as you see, whether it's the uh, survivorship data or the HPV data, mothers are, uh, are largely mentioned and child. And this is without us priming. This is without us talking to them about, well, so what are your mothers doing? Or uh, what, what about you as a mother? I also want you to note this, that fathers, again, are largely absent within the, uh, if you can say, the rhetorical construction of illness uh, in, in these uh, data set. 
So what I want to go over specifically are some three findings, but let's get, let's get a little bit more context. This is going to be silly, okay? Just bear with me. I think I was amazed by this, that I realized when I was doing a search for mother, you can't take the mother out of chemotherapy, but that showed, in, and I went, wait a second, you can't take the mother out of chemotherapy. Cite me. Uh, you can't take the mother out of the chemotherapy, but the women were telling us this. They were telling us this at every step, not just about chemotherapy, but about the larger cancer experience, whether it's prevention or whether it's treatment, you can't take mother out. And these are just some, these are some um, uh, just brief illustrative quotes, but for example, my mom uh, liked to die because I wouldn't put anything on my head, said a cancer survivor. I wouldn't wear anything, I just went with the bald head. So even mother as, uh, as fashionista, if you will. Uh, I had uh, by this time moved in with my mother because I couldn't take care of myself anymore, says another cancer survivor. Mothers being, and this was not unusual for people to talk about that their mothers, regardless of age, became the primary, can uh, primary support for them. But Here's the other thing, as Katie also said in that cohabitating morbidity, when mothers are sick, they're also still the primary caregiver. When mothers are sick, they're still the primary caregiver, and they're still worried about cooking meals, by the way. Matter of fact, what, we're, what we found in one case is that because I'm sick, I'm going to make the meal even more elaborate, as if, uh, I don't know, a pushback really against the disease that would rob them of the role of mothering. And then, of course, this, I would get mother to drive me. So mothers are, or fashionistas, they're chauffeurs, um, and, uh, and of course, they are caregivers. But here specifically is the focus on mothers as guides, this uh, idea of illness and wellness as a journey. And so you need, if you will, a Sherpa to guide you across this. Well, guess who we choose? So I'm holding you all accountable just as I'm holding me accountable because I've sat at many a table when we said, we need mothers at the table. We need to make sure that we're partnering with mothers. Mothers have to be there, except mothers are exhausted. Mothers are too busy trying to force hot dogs down their kids' throat. They're too busy trying to force wigs onto their daughters' heads. They're too busy uh, chauffeuring. And so this idea that let's be mindful when we say let's have mothers at the tables that they might be busy at that table over there and not be busy at your table over here. Um, so let's look at mothers, boy, have to do everything. So really this idea that they also have to map the physical terrain, if you will. Thank you. I, and I'm going to skip over some of these. I'd be glad to share some with you. Uh, I love this one because she's not even a mother now, but she's already invoking this idea that, oh my gosh, if I'm a mom, I'm not worried about me, but you know, I'd have to look at everything if I'm going to get my daughter the, the HPV vaccine. I'd have to weigh it from risk and anything from side effects. I mean, honestly, not that I want my daughter to be sexually active, but if I knew she was and there was that risk, then I would seriously consider it and I would look into it a lot further. I, I hope you're feeling kind of a little bit of that weight there of I would look into everything. Um, and, and this idea that she not only has to worry about being the steward in some ways of her daughter's sexuality, but then also this idea that I also have to protect my daughter's body against uh, the ravages of this nasty HPV vaccine. Um, now here's a survivorship study. Now this is a little intertwined. I love the way people talk. We're not Hollywood. We don't make sense, but look at this. Let's look at this in layers upon layers of daughter-mother interaction. I saw both of my aunts go through cancer, same age, 25. My aunt went through it exactly how I did, you know, had her child, then she was diagnosed after. I kind of did like she did, you know? It's like a milk duck clot or something, that's what it is, you know? But the more I waited, the worse it got. You know, I'd be telling my husband, what is? Can you feel this or is it just me? You know, is it my imagination? But my mom finally made me go. 
So it's just hard, you know, when you have a new baby, which I'm the uh, type of person I don't ask for help. So my mom did take off work and help me with it. I went by myself, well, with my daughter, eight years old. So weaving her own mothering story, because she couldn't breastfeed at the time. She was having a really lot of imposter uh, problems there because she didn't want her, child, her, her infant to see someone else as her mother because she couldn't hold her infant. But notice that she's comparing her physical symptoms with that of the aunt and the aunt becoming a mother and this uh, clogged milk duct. But then also I love this part right here is that um, I don't ask for help, so my mom did take off work. So you don't ask for help, but mom is there. And I also found this interesting, this idea that I'd be telling my husband to poke around, poke around my body, poke around my terrain, but it's the mother who finally says, get your butt to the doctor. Um, so we talk about uh, protectors of family body and bodies within the families. You have to not only uh, protect your family, but I love the uh, and the family's bodies, but the idea that you're also simultaneously protecting the family itself. And of course, mapping the system uh, or the symptoms. Moral terrain. And then let me stop here maybe, uh, although there's a really juicy quote I kind of want to show you in just a second. Uh, moral terrain. Now, as I've said, uh, in, in a lot of our research, we've talked about how uh, women talk about or don't talk about the HPV and HPV vaccine in a vacuum of silence. What we have called Hudson et al. have called a sphere of silence. So they know that in some ways they're the, more, uh, the moral custodian, but they also want help, but they don't know how to ask for help, and yet they don't think it should be talked about by anybody else as well. So, uh, so this is toward the end. She's now realizing this HPV vaccine shot is kind of a moral issue. Uh, I would kind of think that your church should be discussing it maybe because that is where I get a lot of my moral foundation and my moral knowledge and what and whatnot. I mean, maybe it is something they should be discussing in church. So this idea that, look, I've got to, I've got to protect the morality of my family. I've got to protect the morality of my daughter. I'm alone in it. My doctor's not talking about it. The churches aren't talking about it. But I've got to execute this decision um, or advise her to. Uh, and, and maybe the church would, should help me out there. This is one, um, I want to say I hope you find it as heartbreaking as I do. My cancer has a 1 in 95% chance it's going to keep coming back, so you know it's eventually going to kill me. And the third time I st of, of recurrence, I started going to all these doctors and everybody was giving me the Xanax. You know, I was taking like 15 Xanax a day, had to go to inpatient treatment to get off the Xanax. So that was 28 more days without taking care of my children. And then when I got off, uh, got out of Woodridge, they're like, well, you haven't made a house payment in three months, so we're foreclosing on your house now. So then, okay, not only am I letting my children down by not being there for them, but now they're going to lose their home. And the physical part of the thing, I'll keep talking if I want to keep talking. Uh, and the physical part of the thing, uh, uh, part of the first two to three times was horrible. But this last time of what I'm having to go through mentally and being addicted to the drugs and with my kids, that type of stuff was so much harder than the physical. But you think about something that uh, just briefly of talking about Elmberger's work on uh, illness and mothering interruption, that this idea that, that illness stops a mother from, in some ways, from her what's called moral responsibility. That, that cancer survivors who are mothers also think about how, how is my moral responsibility to my children impeded. So you think about this woman that is wrestling with addiction, but she's also losing the very house that her children, in, in which her children live, and the cancer almost becomes this part of it. Uh, she is a survivor, but not, and that, uh, that wrestling with, and I, I love going back to that guilt of wrestling with, that you are, you are addicted, and you are now losing your home, and what about the children. What about the children? Um, this is also, and, and then we're, I'm just going to stop right here. Uh, guides across informational terrain. In addition, I, I'm not going to go through this because we need time for questions. Uh, the guides across informational terrain, this idea that 
in addition to being uh, morally responsible for your own, uh, you, to be the moral compass in your family, to be the moral protective of your children, not only to know the bodies of your children and protect the bodies of your children and subsequently the bodies of your family and then protect your own body. I hope you're exhausted. And don't forget, you're protecting your man's body too. Um, you also have to know everything. And I mean everything. You have to know about HPV. You have to know about the vaccine. You have to, and you also have to advise your children through cancer survivorship. Um, so, but I'm not going to go in that right now because we need to open up, uh, open up to questions because we've had some really good, good uh, topics today. So thank you. And let's open up to questions. Let me open the floor for questions. Don't be shy. I have a question for Amber. Uh, what does the literature say about class and differences in food ways and attitudes about the family meal? Well, it's interesting because there's some <clears throat> dispute about um, you. I mean, most of the stuff that they that they talked about in terms, see, they haven't explored attitudes about the family meal. They haven't asked people who are making family meals like anything. So, so the so the real answer to your question is we don't know because we haven't looked at that. But um, what we what they looked at in terms of class has been uh, contradictory. Sometimes they say that people uh, who are from lower income families, poor and lower income families aren't able to pull off family meals because of multiple jobs and transportation issues and when people get home and get back to the house. But then other research suggests that people who are in lower uh, uh, income families, poor families, are home and they are eating meals together more often. And um, I think it's one of the ways that they're able to communicate or perform familyness in a socially acceptable and applauded kind of way is we may not have this and that, but we do sit down and have a meal together. So I just I thought that was interesting that I there isn't there there's research that's supporting either either side. But I don't I don't know from attitudes because we haven't really looked at it very much at all. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, my question is actually on uh, protective buffering. Um, with protective buffering, is that managing and negotiating uh, the communication around it, or is it? Um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to finish this question honestly. Um, but can you can you go more a little bit more in depth on protective buffering? Okay, so. Um, many participants talk in one way or another through our study about engaging in some type of protective buffering. So it would be what they tended to talk about was something that would cause additional stress. So if it's the cancer, um, if it's the cancer treatment, whatever was causing the additional stress, that is what they chose to not disclose to buffer their family from. Because they would find, so the mothers would say, um, you know, I told my children I had cancer, but I didn't tell them about the cancer diet or like the cancer treatment or what that was going to be like because they couldn't handle that stress and I couldn't handle them having that stress. It was the emotional labor they had to go through. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have, have, along with that, have you considered uh, looking at potential um, backlash? in relationships there um, with people being upset that you're 13 and no one told you know you're 18 and you're just now five years later finding out that you have cancer have you done any kind of look at that at all no i haven't okay. but i think that would be very fascinating <laughs> and when i was talking to a student of mine yesterday about this protective buffering and when you disclose cancer she said her grandmother didn't tell anyone in her family she was having um, a brain tumor removed until the day before the surgery. And, and then she talked about how her father was furious that he never knew her mother had cancer up until he was taking her to surgery. So I think that would be very fascinating because we you think that you're making the situation better, but are you really making it better? Because now they feel excluded and they feel hurt and they feel left out. I wanted to add to that great question because when we talk about one of the primary uh, tools 
one of the best tools for cancer prevention, especially in this area, is the HPV vaccine. And by and large, what we found with women in the focus groups and the interviews is that they said, don't tell your child what it is. Uh, don't t so is, uh, and if you do, you talk about it in terms of, of cancer. So still even at that, that stage of pre-cancer, you have this idea of shielding family uh, and this idea of, of let's give our child a vaccine and not explain what the, what the vaccine is. And almost feeling uh, that that is, that helps you be a stronger moral protector of your family. In fact, one young woman said, if I give my daughter the vaccine, it's like handing her a condom. So, so this idea that, that one of the, the, the primary ways that you must protect them is through silence. And we found that, acro we found that across, uh, across um, uh, study areas too. Just don't talk about it. Protect everybody by not talking about it. Any other burning questions? Yes, I see that. Um, do you think with the HPV um, vaccine, some of the issues is because people just don't really know that much about it. You know, they, it's so new. Um, I know my daughter got it a couple of years ago, but people, I didn't know it was out until her doctor told me, and he was uncomfortable really talking about it with us, and it was me saying yes, because this is not, I mean, the HPV vaccine, yes, it protects women, but get it from men, you know? So I, I, was, I was surprised at how uncomfortable my daughter's doctor was at the time, just talking about it. Well, and that was certainly reflected in our research, too, is, um, first off, the vaccine is not actually that new. It was approved in the United States, what, uh, it, where, 2006, but it was approved in Europe. It, it was on the market, I wanna say, to, to decade before. It's, um, but what we're finding is that even talking about it, there is a constraining influence because doctors not wanting to talk about it uh, for fear of, of making patients uncomfortable. Uh, one of, my, uh, one of, one of uh, my favorite quotes was uh, from a young woman who was 18 who said, I, I don't like to talk about to my doctor about personal stuff like that. <laughs> and so it, it was really interesting that you don't go to your doctor. The doctors don't seem to be going to the patients. The, the moms are sometimes cited that they have very little information about HPV and the HPV vaccine. And on top of it, their major source of information, advertisements, great deal of skepticism. So, they're, so uh, they, dis, uh, they discard the primary source of information, don't seek out the, 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 uh, the medical information, and yet then they're supposed to be the reservoir of knowledge. And they're the ones that really do seem to make a difference. Daughters will say, my mom came to me and said, you go get it. But the moms have to be informed, but they're not necessarily. Well, I'm watching our time, and we're um, it's 1 o'clock. So I want a round of applause to thank our speakers.